Awesome. Well, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Isabel Velasquez. Uh, today, we're going to be talking through Chapter 10 or Walk Through 4, which is on longitudinal analysis with federal student uh, and federal, oops, I think I did a typo, um, but uh, students with disabilities data. Um, and so uh, today, I created these slides using Sheridan. I looked up how to say it. I hope I'm saying it right. Um, and unfortunately, I spent too much time learning Sherrigan to learn Flipbook R, which is another package that people have been using that's really, really cool. Um, but hopefully, uh, this will work for today. And so today, what I was planning to do is go through the slides, and I'll stop at each section for any questions or comments that folks may have. Um, and I do have some discussion questions, too, that are highlighted in green, and I'll just stop for those as well. So topics introduced, um, actually federal data, uh, especially in this format is something that I use a lot at my job. Um, we tend to use only publicly available data for a lot of our reporting. And so we have to kind of handle it with, uh, you know, whatever format it comes in or, and, and take whatever steps are needed in order to clean it up. Um, and so you'll see that in this chapter, it spends a lot of time just talking about importing and uh, tidying up the data. And at least in my experience, that's the way <laughs> it generally goes. Um, if uh, you have ever seen the data science hierarchy of needs, uh, which goes from like data collection to uh, data cleaning to analysis and then to predictive modeling, I spend almost the entirety of my time in the first two just collecting and cleaning. And I, I will admit, um, I actually do very little uh, actual modeling in my job. And so I really welcome anybody's thoughts um, about this approach and uh, things that they would do at, at their role or um, things they would supplement with this model, uh, just because this is something that I know uh, very little about. Cool. So starting off in the chapter, uh, each one of them starts off with the functions and vocabulary. And so I just have them listed here. And then uh, the methods used in this chapter are is uh, a longitudinal analysis. And so there are actually many different types of uh, da longitudinal data analysis, but essentially uh, what it is, is looking at repeated information over time. And so these sorts of analysis can help uh, measure things like change or stability, what happens over someone's life, um, and then if it's uh, designed a certain way, maybe even causal relationships. And so I, I consider the data that's provided in this chapter as repeated cross-sectional data. Um, so cross-sectional means point in time and not the same people, uh, but over different time periods um, trying to capture the same information. And so uh, there's other types of longitudinal studies. So for example, a cohort study might be looking at the effects of age over time. Um, there could be panels just tracking the same people and seeing what happens over the course of their lives. Uh, actually, uh, my previous role used to work on a federal longitudinal survey uh, that actually started in 1979. And uh, when uh, the the respondents were actually old enough to start having children, they did another spinoff survey where it tracked their children. And so you can imagine the analysis that uh, comes from a study like that would be different than, you know, things like this one where it's collecting um, different years of data, but the cohort would look, uh, com could look completely different from one year to the next. So just a couple of questions. Um, what kind of analysis do you usually run? And, uh, when do you look at data over time in your work? Well, I haven't looked at anything over this, um, this span of time. It would be more over a course, um, so of a few months. I don't know. I wouldn't have thought of that as longitudinal, but by the definition here, I think it would it would apply. Yeah, the way I think about it is like there's like a classical longitudinal sort of study, um, and then longitudinal like 
the definition in terms of like looking at things over time. But um, welcome any edits to, to that. Okay, cool, thank you. Well, at one point I was uh, part of a project to try and create a longitudinal data set that would track teachers and their preparation in California, um, California schools, in California um, education programs. And then the, the idea was to, to try to track uh, their outcomes as teachers. I don't think mm -hmm. that it, <laughs> I don't think that it really panned out, but uh, that was a pretty ambitious, more longitudinal effort. Something that we do, I guess it's longitudinal, is that we look at course success rates over time and how they might, you know, fluctuate from quarter to quarter. If there's, you know, students are more successful in the spring than they are in the fall, or, you know, some specific, you know, section 200, which is an upper level might be less successful than, you know, uh, an earlier course, or maybe there's instructors, some instructors are better at success rates and stuff like that. So, you know, I think that's some longitudinal kind of analysis we do. I ask just out of curiosity, how do you measure success? Uh, for for us, we we measure success either by a student getting a 2.0, and that's really up to your institution. That's as an institution, we, we say success is above a 2.0 or a pass in a course, and we you know they're they're indicated as passing as successful in their course. And it, again, it some institutions might be 2.5, some may exclude passing or fail grades. It's really your prerogative, but that's the baseline that we do. Sorry, I'm terrible. I joined late and my week has been so busy. I haven't read the chapter, but I'm guessing we're talking about comparing data that's the same, but different time periods. Yeah, like just over, over, over time. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so as the retention specialist, uh, retention is a huge one for me. Uh, so percentages of students retained, uh, which just means they're enrolled at census state um, in the next semester. That is how we define persistence. Um, and census state is just the 10th business day of the semester. Um, I also, um, our institution has a official semester withdrawal request form. Um, so I've been doing the analysis on that. So I've also followed the trends comparing fall to fall and spring to spring as far as um, the, not only the numbers of how many withdrawal requests we're getting, but they're the students reported reason for, for the request and their major and classification. Thank you. Thanks all for sharing. Cool. So um, that was just the overview of the chapter, but now let's dig into some actual data. So first thing is importing data, um, which <laughs> as this chapter shows, could be something that uh, takes a lot of um, work and there are a lot of different kinds of options. Uh, first things first, just wanted to mention the special note on here that uh, the chapter mentions that the function called here can actually be from multiple different packages. And so uh, if you have plier loaded and here loaded, and you use the here function, um, uh, the R might get confused as to which one you're referring to. Um, and so in order to clarify that in the code, you can use the double colons to declare the namespace or the package name and specify which one you would like to use, um, which is why you would see here, colon, colon, here, and parentheses. Um, and just a quick question, have any of you ever run into package conflicts? I think one of my biggest is select. I, I don't know like what causes a conflict, but sometimes I, I run into a lot of issues with select. <laughs> Yes, I did. In fact, I posted in Slack as a like, I don't understand. It runs 
when I was working just on the code line by line, it runs fun and fine. And then I put it in, you know, I knit it in R Markdown and it breaks. And someone pointed out to me, oh, let's see, I think it was select. Yeah, it was select that, that broke. And they pointed out like, try, try adding dplyr first. And then I was like, I fixed it. So I, I don't know. I was, I was working with a pretty unique package, so I don't know what's in there that was not compatible, but, or was conflicting. Yep, definitely happened. Um, but cool. And so in terms of importing data, the chapter goes through a variety of different options. Um, the first option is in the data EDU package, uh, the individual data sets, the combined files in a list format and uh, the combined data set in a data frame format are all included in the package. So, um, you know, uh, which is very handy, but isn't always or usually the case uh, in order to actually like get the data. Another option listed in the chapter is that uh, you can use the, the source URL and use this download file uh, function in order to get to the URL and then save it into a CSV wherever you want it to um, be saved, which is here listed as desk file. So it would be in your data, longitudinal data, and then the file um, would be saved within those folders. Um, another option is going to the URL, downloading the CSV, and then putting it into the, that folder uh, individually and then reading the CSV using the read CSV function. Um, another option which the chapter goes through is using the package called per, which uh, essentially loops over, um, you know, the different things that you're trying to do. And then uh, reading the CSV in this map function that is from per. And so what this would, do is it looks at all of the different files in your destination path, uh, which is the data longitudinal data folders. Um, it lists all those files individually and then uh, goes through and then reads CSV each, uh, each one uh, using map. And I think that's how the chapter ultimately ends up doing it, just to be able to do it from the very beginning. But even though these are quite a few options, there's, there's actually other ways of doing it too. Um, I haven't actually used this package before. It's called Room. <laughs> I think it's from our studio, but supposedly it's super fast and super easy to um, import all sorts of file types using Room. So I probably really should learn it. Um, and uh, as some of you may know, my older brother is actually a very talented R user. And I asked him, how would you uh, import this data? And so what he did is um, go like using that, that source URL, but then also using per in order to download each file uh, to your destination folder, um, which is another option that like if you want to, you know, increase uh, how much of your code is automatic as opposed to, you know, downloading individual files. Um, but I think uh, ultimately, it's up to up to you and how you want to work in order to decide the different ways that you would like to import data. Um, and so another question I have is, how else have you imported data? Well, what am I missing here? Something that I've done a lot lately was uh, connecting to databases to import data. Nice. Um, I know they have the package. There's dplyr and then there's dbplyr. And the dbplyr is the one that like you use as an interface to connect to databases. And that one's very helpful, especially like if you have that on your campus, you don't have to, you know, go to, if you're using SQL or you're using something else, save it and then bring it back in. You can just do it all in R using the dbplyr package. And it's really nice because you can still use like, tidy commands like select and mutate and all these other functions there it's not all encompassing but you can use a lot of those on 
a database and then collect it and then continue to do your analysis without ever having to leave R. And I found that very beneficial when I came across it, it, it did wonders. That's super awesome. I uh, very rarely use databases. And so it's, it's cool to hear that there are ways of doing it within R. <laughs> um, the thought of installing like MySQL makes me nervous. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm a total new to, to R, but um, in the environment panel, there's an, in R Studio, there's an import data set dropdown menu. Very cool. And then I was just importing by, um, you know, entering in the URLs and updating them and then naming the files. That's fantastic. The R Studio ID has so many things that I'm like, I'm not even aware of. <laughs> so that's super cool. Um, awesome. All right. So next step is processing the data. And you can see here that there are nine different steps outlined in the chapter. Um, and uh, this is a lot. <laughs> I have to admit, like even just writing these slides, I'm like, oh my gosh, we have to do a lot to this data. Uh, but again, like mentioned earlier, I, I feel like this is, um, you know, a big reality whenever using federal data or state data and, and just having to go through and tidy it up. Um, and so one question is like, why, why, why you go through all this trouble? Like, why not just like pull out the things that you need and, and do the things that you need and, and leave it at that? Um, and that's true. I, I feel like every analyst or anybody working with data just has to take into consideration um, the tools they have on hand, <laughs> sorry, how much time they have, but really like, taking the upfront time to be able to, or to tidy your data, put it into a format that, you know, future you would really appreciate. And that works uh, very flexibly with the other um, uh, tidyverse packages is, um, it's just really beneficial. And, um, and again, like just depending on your deadlines and your capacity that uh, it, it's just something that um, is generally like a good practice to be able to do. And so that way um, it's very flexible in terms of if you want to do analysis or visualizations or anything like that in the future, um, it's relatively easy versus having to do, you know, the cleaning all over again. And so I'll just go through the different steps that uh, were taken to process the data um, and uh, just walk through it and, and we can stop for questions uh, towards the end. And so, the first thing uh, in the chapter is uh, right at, at this point in time, you have the data sets in individual lists that were downloaded from the URL. So there's uh, a bunch of files all in list form, um, and we would like to put them all together in a data frame to be able to run our model and our visualizations. And so uh, in the chapter, it's noted that when you look at the chapter, the column names for the 2016 data, uh, the column names don't match the other uh, the other data sets. And this is a problem if you want to bind rows. Uh, generally, like they need the the column names to be the same in order to do that properly. And so the, the chapter goes through you know the the details of going through each uh, each file, like making sure the column names are the same, making sure like the variables aren't vastly different or anything like that. And to fix like this issue with um, the 2016 data, it's that it has some extra rows that you can skip using the read CSV uh, function that wasn't needed in the other files. The next step is to uh, pick the variables. And so um, it, it, in this chapter, like the analytic questions that we ultimately want to model are on uh, the, the gender variables. And so this uh, essentially says, I want only the columns that uh, that mention the year, mention the state, mention the district, and mention um, the gender. And that is why uh, uh, like, um, they go through and, and do this. And so the next step in this is, uh, uh, in the chapter, they created a function that essentially does this for every single one of the lists um, the, the data sets in the list. 
and then uses map to go through and, and do it each time um, for every single file. So for every single file, we're only selecting the variables that we're interested in. And now that uh, all the files are have the same column names, um, have the same variables, now we can go ahead and bind the rows into uh, a data frame, which is uh, another format of data in order to be able to do um, the next steps. And so the next step that they take in the chapter is to take a look at the data itself and see what, what's contained in there. And so using the count function, um, the chapter looks at the SEA disability category. And so here's just the top five, uh, that's what head five means. And then it sees uh, what are the um, most common uh, categories listed uh, inside the data. And so you can see it says all disabilities, autism, deaf blindness, et cetera. And so again, because of the analytic question posed in the chapter, we're only really interested in all disabilities. So all of them grouped together. And so, um, that is what this filter function does. It goes to the SEA disability category, uh, pulls out only the ones that say all disabilities. And uh, again, uh, based on like what it is that we need, it also filters the SEA education environment to uh, the values that are equivalent to total age three to five and total age six to 21. So this is just, um, uh, again, just like filtering the data set to what it is that we ultimately want to look at. The next step in the chapter is renaming the different variables. And so um, uh, in R, like having lowercase variable names, um, things without spaces, uh, you know, things without weird characters, it's generally better just because it's a, a easier to keep track of and requires less um, you know, working around when you want to actually use those variables. And so this is just renaming them. So rather than state name with a space in between, it's just state. Um, and the way I remember rename because uh, what you want it to be called is on the left, uh, what it was originally called is on the right. I just think of the mutate function, which is uh, similarly like, what, what it is that you want is on the left um, and what you uh, like are using to create that variable is on the right. Um, so that's how I remember it because otherwise I totally switch them around. <laughs> and then uh, uh, next step is when you look at the state column, you'll see, for example, Alabama um, is there, but it's uh, with just the uppercase A and then another one where it's all uppercase. And uh, that's an issue because um, you know they're essentially the same thing. This is probably because we're looking at uh, data sets from different times and uh, the processing of data just sometimes varies year to year, whoever the analyst is who prepared it. And so uh, in order to remedy this, they, uh, we create or recreate the state column using the two lower function and so this takes everything under state and puts it all in lowercase um, so that they're all the same. And that was like really handy in terms of fixing this particular problem. Uh, but as you can imagine, sometimes data sets really vary in terms of you know, what, what it looks like. Um, if you imagine you could have some data sets where it says Alabama and then another, um, another row just has the, the abbreviation for the state. And so being able to do this wouldn't be enough um, in order to fix that column. So it very much depends on uh, what the data looks like and, and how you ultimately um, go to address like the issues in the data uh, cleaning. Okay, and then the last step in processing is uh, transforming the data into tidy data, um, which is the format uh, generally used to work with the tidyverse set of packages. Uh, the definition is uh, each variable forms a column, each observation forms a row, each cell is a single measurement. And by having every, like, or your data available in this format, it just makes it a lot easier to work with. 
I remember when I was first starting um, learning R and using ggplot2 to visualize data, and I couldn't figure out why uh, things weren't visualizing the way I wanted it to. And it turns out that I was trying to use non-tidy data in ggplot2. And, uh, and ggplot2 just doesn't like that. <laughs> and so <laughs> just taking the time to clean your data and tidy it up uh, makes it possible to use these uh, different packages much, much easier than trying to force non-tidy data into them. And so this is what it ultimately looks like. Um, using the function called pivot longer, it creates, uh, the, per the definition, each variable forming a row, each observation, oh, sorry, each variable forming a column, each observation forming a row, and each cell in a single measurement. Um, and so you can see that here. There's a column for year, there's a column for state, and then um, within gender, like you'll see things repeated, but that's the way that uh, the tidy um, data likes to be uh, likes to be formatted. Okay, and then just to finish up, um, next is creating a gender variable. And so uh, this is because the um, different age ranges are not important to the analysis. And in a previous session, we had talked about um, using the same variable name when creating a new variable. So because uh, the original variable was called gender, the new variable is called gender, the new variable will overwrite the old, uh, the old variable. Um, generally, that's not how I do it, just because I really don't like having to go all the way back to the beginning to rerun an analysis if I mess up. <laughs> uh, so you could call it like uh, gender new or whatnot. Um, but um, it is another option, you know, if you feel comfortable rewriting uh, variables, you could, you could just name them the same. And so you could see here uh, under gender, uh, it's female and uh, F and M for female and male, as opposed to these different categories. Next step is the total, which is uh, a number, but it wasn't listed as a number originally. If you see it here, total is listed as a character. Um, and so if it's listed as a character, we'd be unable to do the no, like the usual um, numeric stuff to it. <laughs> and so we wanna just make sure that things are in the right type. And so using mutate and as numeric, we turn the total uh, into a number. Uh, using the package Luberdate, uh, we change the year into an actual date format, uh, which is also important if we actually want to uh, track things over time in visualizations and things like that. And so you can see here, year is now a date when it wasn't before. Uh, it, it used to be just a number. Double. Um, stands as for a numeric type. Okay, and then um, one more thing. Uh, I think like this is the end of the process, but I, I put um, the next step, but anyway, um, is getting rid of the NAs. So using filter and is NA, um, the exclamation point means like not, or like the opposite. So it's saying filter, uh, keep everything that uh, isn't an NA. Um, and this is important uh, for um, finishing up, cleaning up your data. But I would say, um, and uh, you know, there's so much literature around this that uh, how one considers the NAs is really important. Um, it very much depends on the context in, in which the data was collected and how you want to use missing data. Um, why is it missing and things like that. Um, so uh, just a couple of questions I had is, what do you consider when you're removing NAs or if you're removing, or what do you consider when thinking about removing NAs? And, um, and while this particular chapter talks about filtering is an A, there's um, a lot of other functions that remove NAs uh, as well. And so just wondering, um, how else have you removed NAs in the past? Um, I, I think I have an interesting example. So again, with the semester withdrawal request that I've been working with. Um, so one of the reasons, so students can select multiple reasons to, uh, you know, want a semester withdrawal. Um, and one of the reasons is like, one of the reasons they can choose is like, choose not to answer. 
but because they can select multiple, sometimes uh, I was seeing that they <laughs> selected like personal reasons and choose not to disclose. And it's like, but you did disclose it. <laughs> um, and then other students who, who didn't select anything, and I guess it was optional because it didn't, they were allowed to not choose anything at all. And in that case, they didn't disclose anything because they didn't choose anything anyway. So that was fun cleaning that up. So I had to go, I had to go in and say, you know, only if all of these categories other than this last one, so pretty much I just rewrote the last one. I just ignored whatever was there before and said, if there's a reason in these other categories, then this one's blank, <laughs> then mm -hmm. there's, then, then not this one. But if there, if all of these other ones are blank, then yes, they did not disclose anything anyway. So that was kind of interesting. And in that same one, um, if for whatever reason, the form didn't select a semester that they were withdrawing from, then I threw it out. Um, because there was no way for me to track what semester it was supposed to be withdrawing from. <laughs> so so I, I threw those ones out, but yeah, so that, that was my story with NAs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah, especially like if, if, you know, data validation is really important. Um, in a survey that I worked on, uh, they had don't knows as NAs, and um, so like it was impossible to know whether a survey question was an NA because, you know, the, the person didn't actually get the question or because they didn't know. <laughs> and it was like, hey, we want to know if they don't know. And so, um, yeah, like the context of like the actual data collection is, is super duper important. <laughs> I've used the drop NA function. Mm. I just, I think that's just one of those where I just like Google it and it popped up. And so um, I think it does, I just looked at the documentation. I think it does the same thing as filter. Uh, exclamation in is, is NA, um, it's in type ER. So I'm oh, nice. it does what it's supposed to be doing. You can um, specify a column or you can just say for the whole data frame, I think, uh, or multiple columns, but it'll, it'll rank the columns. Yeah, That's I found cool. the same. <laughs> I found it on Stack Overflow too. I'll drop it in there. In Stack Overflow, I think it's like a couple down. You can see it there as well. The example. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So, so in my data set, so for what the did not disclose, I have replace NA. Once I cleaned it up, and then for the semesters, I did drop an A. And replace an A is like, if there's an A, put a zero in there or, or something like that. Is that right? Uh, I think that's typically what people use it for. I, I used it to say, to specifically say, did not disclose. Uh, so replace an A, quote, did not disclose. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, and I think there's another tidyverse function that's like complete. And so it's like if any row or if a row has any NAs to just drop that row. Um, and again, like I, I think in some analysis, like that makes sense and in some analysis it doesn't. So it's just thinking through, you know, what does it mean um, when you're removing NAs? Cool. Cool. Okay. And then the last thing, this is actually in the next um, section of the chapter, but I just put it in here because I, I think it is considered processing data. Um, but this is uh, just taking a look at the states that have the highest uh, average count of students with disabilities. Um, and this is for the eventual visualization of this. And then um, using another filter function in order to say, I only want the states uh, in California, Florida, New York, Pennsylvania, and Texas. I apologize, I should have put the results in here, but um, those are the five states with the most uh, number of students with disabilities in this data set. And so uh, I just wanted to pause here too, because um, 
uh, I will disclose, I, I did not write this chapter, but as, as when we were writing the book, one of the things we talked a lot about is like, how do we display our walkthroughs and the analysis? Um, should we like standardize everything? And as you're reading the book, you may notice a whole bunch of things, right? Like um, where people write comments, uh, whether they put the data for a visualization within ggplot or outside of ggplot. Um, how do people, you know, organize uh, their code and, and, you know, what are the steps that the different people take in order to clean um, a particular data set? And so, like on the left side here, I wrote out uh, what this chapter does in terms of processing and tidying the data set. And on the right, I kind of thought through, like, how would I do it? Um, and so I uh, tend to avoid lists as, as much as possible. <laughs> I don't like working with lists. I don't really understand her. And so uh, usually my objective is to take the list and make it into a data frame as soon as I possibly can. And so, um, so I think like this is how I would approach it just because of that. And, but really like there's uh, so many different ways and um, you know, ultimately they'll get you to the different, uh, you know, tidy sort format of data that you need ultimately for your analysis. Um, and so I just really, I just wanted to note that, um, that it was just, it, it was uh, a lot of fun, like thinking through, you know, um, somebody else's process and what I could take from that. Uh, you know, I, again, uh, like my aversion to lists and my, also my aversion to creating uh, my own functions, you know, is something that, that I could work on as an analyst in order to um, get better my own skills. So, um, so before we move on to the next section, any questions or comments about the processing data or just reflections about um, how you would process this data if you know your manager asked you to? Um, not, not necessarily about the process. I was just thinking about your previous slide. Um, mm -hmm. When you selected the states. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. You went too far. Um, you mentioned that those were the top six. Oh, yep. Should say top five. <laughs> top five. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm <laughs> comment. Um, I guess, I guess my question would be, wouldn't it make more sense to, I don't know, use use something that, yeah, the, I, I'm just looking at this other example I, from actually mastering Shiny where it, it does like, I don't know, I just that, isn't there a way to like select the greatest, to automatically say like select the greatest oh. in, I don't know if this if this applies, but I'll put it in the chat. But it it has a it has a, a, I think frequency. Anyway, it's been a while since I've looked at this, but pretty much it says like select the top five and then mm -hmm. do an other category for everything underneath it. I I don't think you need to do the other category. You just I don't know. I think just, yeah, yeah. just I I would try to find a way if I was looking at my data and I knew I wanted the top five, mm -hmm. I would try to avoid then in my process saying, okay, I can see that these states are the top five. So now I'm going to filter for those states. Well, if your data changes, right? Yeah. Your code should be something that can automatically just select the top five instead of having to manually look at what the top five are. Yeah, no, that's Something a great that, point. Yeah, exactly. another approach that I take, not necessarily, I guess, right, but kind of going over Morgan's point about like the data changing is I usually sometimes arrange it. So, like, arrange the value I'm interested in from least to greatest and then like slice okay yeah five. i was so thinking yeah. there was a better way to do that so it's kind of i 
guess I kind of might get around the issue of like the data changing because if you identify the column, it's not going to change just the ranking within the columns and slice one through five still rem remains the same. So that's the approach I would take is like after the summarize, do a range by mean count and then the pipe and then slice one colon six. And I think that should get you kind of that. I think it's, a, it's another approach you can take as well. Yeah, I, actually, uh, um, I totally forgot about it. Your like slice does do that, um, and I think in this particular case, you could group by state, and then arrange, and then slice. So that way, this is automated. Um, but that's a great um, point, right? Like here, the the column or the vector of states is manually put in, and so. Um, you know, it's one thing if you focus on these five states and you know you'll always be looking at these five states, but if you're actually interested in like the top, um, then then you wouldn't do it this way. Um, yeah. I'm glad that made sense because I'm totally brain dead. <laughs> <laughs> the end no, of it's, a, it's a great call out. <laughs> And sometimes it, like, you're like, why did you hard code this? <laughs> like, um, yeah, cool. Okay, cool. Uh, so the next part is actually analyzing the data. Uh, and the chapter goes through a long step of, or lots of steps of just visualizing the data. Um, and this is like, you know, a great reminder to, to know one's data. It's helpful to, you know, look at the data set create some summary statistics, but actually visualizing it is another just fantastic way of really getting to know what's contained within. Um, and I know we are running out of time. So um, I'll just go through the different steps taken. So the first one, so if you notice here, uh, the data is actually outside of the ggplot. And this allows you to um, you know, manipulate it beforehand before you actually go ahead and visualize it. And so it is taking this high count, which was the, the data filtered by the top five states, and then um, adding another filter saying, I only want to look at uh, female students. Uh, for age, I only want total age six through 21. And then take that data that's been manipulated further and put it into the ggplot um, to actually visualize it. And so the plot here is here on the right, um, and so you can see uh, for these top states, a few different things. Uh, over time, it seems like the counts are going up. There's a really big uh, like difference in terms of how many students are um, considered or counted as students with disability in California compared to Texas, compared to Pennsylvania. And you know that, that makes sense, right? Different states have different number of students um, First of all, but then you know, uh, it, depending on the different context and um, content expertise that you could bring into this, like it might, um, you know, these differences uh, might have other explanations as well. And then another third thing, oh, I might have already mentioned this, that it looks like it's going up over time. Like there's like a gentle slope. And so then we do it again with male students. Um, and so uh, we can see the similar sort of um, sort of trends here where there's a gentle slope going up, a big difference between the states. But if you notice uh, in here, the axis is actually different, right? Um, here, uh, it goes uh, to 100, like the middle one is 160,000. And here it was 300,000, is that right? One, two, three, four, five, yeah, 300,000. Um, and so, uh, you know, when looking at them side by side, it might be like, oh, they look very similar. But then when you notice the axis, um, you, you'll see that there's just much higher counts of male students. Um, and so, you know, another thing that you could do is uh, uh, on your GU plot, make it so that they have the same Y axis to be able to like compare them more easily. Here's the total count, so just added together. Um, and the way that we do that is we take this high count uh, data grouped by the year and the state um, and then summarize 
uh, summarize N, which is the um, which is the total of male and female students together. Okay, and then uh, another visualization is uh, while this tells us like the total over time, um, you know, what does the distribution actually look like within the states? And so there are different ways of visualizing distributions, but one of them is through these uh, black plots. So this is uh, uh, showing, you know, the top, the middle, and the lowest range for the different states of their counts of students with disabilities. And so um, similarly as before, we see like there's a big uh, difference between the different states in terms of how many of the counts. Um, and uh, we can also just see like the counts in Pennsylvania are much more condensed say than the ones in New York. And so uh, another conclusion from this part is that uh, we can't just compare um, state to state to see the difference uh, in counts between male students and female students because um, the states just vary too much. And so the chapter addresses this by creating a student ratio. Uh, so mm, I was about to say mutating, but transforming the data back into a wide format using pivot wider so that male and female students are in separate columns and then creating a new column using mutate in order to create a ratio. Um, and it gets cut up, but you can see the actual code here. Um, so grouping by year, state, and gender, and then summarizing the sum, um, uh, pivoting wider, <laughs> doing a wide pivot, I guess, both, creating the ratio, and then feeding that back into the ggplot in order to plot uh, the ratio over time. And so you can see it here. Um, the, this is male student to female student and that the slope is like going down a little bit over time. And so the analytic question that uh, we want to go to next is, uh, you know, is this relationship uh, statistically significant across time? Um, we can say our hypothesis is that yes, this ratio is decreasing over the years. And so um, a linear regression allows us to um, to see uh, how the, the statistics actually bear out. Uh, but before I move on, any thoughts or comments, um, especially as we get to this part, which is the part that I would love to learn more about how others use it and, and you know, their approaches, um, uh, just because it's kind of a new field for me. <laughs> Not that's okay. Um, all right. So now we'll prep the data for the actual model. Um, and so we are going back to our child counts uh, for this previous visualization part. We were using the high count um, object data frame in order to see the visualizations because this allowed us to see the biggest states or the states with the highest counts. Um, as opposed to, you know, all 50 states, which might be really messy to see. And so uh, we're going back to child counts um, and then transforming the data so that we can uh, plot it, female students and male students on a single plot and see, you know, what does the relationship look like? And so when you take a look at this, you see like, whoa, there are some really, really high counts in there compared to other counts. Um, so why? Why is this so, <laughs> why, why is there this huge gap? And so when you check the data, um, again, just taking a look, uh, you can see that the, the ones with the highest counts uh, is under the state US outline areas. And so it's, it's an aggregate, it's, that's why it's so big. It's just aggregating all the numbers. And so, um, and so it doesn't make sense to use it in our analysis if we're trying to look at state by state. Um, and uh, and so we will get rid of those. Um, and so by filtering out those particular variables for the, U for the entire US, um, then we replot it as uh, similar to how we did in the beginning. And then we can see, oh, there's this much clearer picture um, and it looks very linear. Um, and uh, we talked about a few chapters ago, there's quite a few assumptions for, um, 
for linear regression and uh, making sure to to check them. Um, and the chapter doesn't go through that. Um, we, uh, you know, had had to make the decision of how much statistics we were going to go into. But um, but I will leave that as an exercise for the readers. <laughs> And so uh, finally, the, um, we go through and create the actual data that we will use for the linear regression model. Um, so excluding the outliers, uh, recreating the, the ratio, um, and only choosing the variables that we're interested in actually modeling. Um, and then an, another final check to see whether we have enough data points to actually be able to model, you know, um, uh, if, if we have too few observations, then maybe um, our model wouldn't be very, very telling just because, you know, it has too little data to go off of. Um, but based on this model, it looks like there's quite a few observations for every year. And so we can go ahead and run the regression. And so um, the way that we do this is using the function called LM, which I believe is from base R. Uh, and there are there is a new package called tidy models which i presume uses tidy data for modeling but i have never used it i'd love to hear any experience um, that you may have with it just because it looks really really cool <laughs> um but uh but you just using base r is good too so the lm function um takes uh, uh runs a regression the ratio versus the year using the model data and then the summary function uh, shows the output of this particular model. And so you can see here um, for the different years, there's no asterisks next to them. Asterisks. And so um, that means uh, it didn't find like a statistically significant difference um, based on the data that was provided. So, um, Finally, uh, just in conclusion, in terms of what we learned, uh, just thinking back to the beginning, um, each state had a different count of students with disabilities. And so uh, we had to make the decision as to how can we run this model, uh, considering that the data will look very, very different um, across states. Uh, we created our hypothesis, looking at the visualizations and seeing um, that there was an increase in uh, accounts of students with disability over time and then when we actually ran the model at least like this one particular model we did not see our, a statistically significant difference that we could report um, but one thing that you know that we try to do a lot of my job um, and I, again just would love to hear how others approach it is you know one data point is useful but um, more data points are more useful and so you know what are other analyses that we could run in order to really flesh out uh, our results, you know, what are the different contexts that we should be considering um, the systems around, you know, students with disability in these different states that we can use to build upon our results. Um, and then, you know, it's it's always a process of okay, we found something and, and discussing it and finding out other questions that we could, you know, take from this particular analysis for our next one. And that's all I had. Um, uh, opening up for <laughs> the last two minutes of questions, and here's a link of the very handy tutorial I used to to learn share again. <laughs> well, your presentation looked absolutely gorgeous. Oh, thank you. <laughs> looked really good. Um, I guess my question is, unless I missed it. Uh, those were total counts of students, right, in each state. Wouldn't it make more sense to, because this total counts of students in special with disabilities, right? Wouldn't it make sense to take that number and divide it by the total number of students per state? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, because states all have different numbers of students because of their size and density. Yeah, so definitely. I, 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 would think, it. <laughs> I would think that would be more useful. Because like saying California has more students with disabilities than Rhode Island, 
that doesn't, that doesn't mean much. Yeah. Definitely. I know it'd be important to see if year by year, these are states with increasing student populations, right? If the largest states are also ones that have mm -hmm. increasing populations. Yeah. I, th I think, th yeah, there's definitely like that question. Um, and I think like, you know, in, in terms of this further analysis, like that could be, you know, the very next one, right? Um, and depending on what the results show, if they agree or, or don't agree, like then considering, you know, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, because it, it could mean, it could be, you know, is there an, an environmental thing going on where students are increasing in disabilities or is it because that state offers better education for students with disabilities and so parents are moving there yeah. for, for, for that education? Yeah, definitely. Like understanding the environment and the context. Um, we think a lot about policy too. Like, you know, maybe the definition for students with disabilities has changed over time and, and things like that. And it seemed like that might be happening. And there was one year where it was more of a rupture, right? Of, like, of growth for one state. It seemed like there was a policy change or something. Uh, I, I think one thing that's happening um, in a lot of public schools is. Um, people are being priced out of their areas. And so they're, they're moving to other states that have lower cost of living. So it'd be interesting to see like, if you look at a place like California, which has a higher cost of living versus other states like Arizona or Colorado, um, you know, what is the population increase and decrease or like movement from, um, you know, into and out of schools and then comparing those states side by side. Definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Thanks so much. Um, if there are any follow-up questions or, or things to discuss, uh, please reach out on Slack and I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you. Bye. Good night.